Now, the second section, uh, which is more on Ottoman life, and I'd like to say very briefly that, that one of the things that really motivated David was his conviction that the story of Crete had been told correctly. From that, we have minute observations of many, many very fine uh, Anglo Ottoman figures. Uh, it connects very much to the later interest of so I now welcome our chair, and so we'll take us through the session. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and, and following on the, this book, David's book will be published next year by John Scott of Cornucopia, who is here, and there is a special plea, anybody who has blocks of text which David sent them, please get in touch with John and send them to him. It will be completely fascinating with I well remember David's talk about Bigliotti, Alfred Bigliotti, who <coughs> drifted between Livorno, Rhodes, Crete, London, Istanbul, and had a finger in many pies, and also articles on Crete, Ali Pasha, uh, Ali Kamal, apparently, Midhat Pasha, and many others of the unusual suspects of 19th century anglo ottoman relations. And um, uh, <coughs> he, like his subjects, was in many ways dust in the lion's paw. Take a phrase of Frere Stark. And we're very privileged to have today John Darwin, former professor of global and imperial history at Nuffield College, author of many books, including one after Tamerlane, <coughs> the Global History of Empire, the Empire Project, The Rise and Fall of the British World System. We all need to read that. And most recently, a book on port cities, unlocking the world in the age of steam. And today he's going to talk to us about um, David, the 19th century, and Anglo-Ottoman relations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, my memories of David go back to my first year at St. John's, as an undergraduate, David was the year above me. And that certainly began a long series, I suppose, quite long conversations. Not that it was uh, uh, at the same time as some other people here. Yeah. But certainly scattered over the years, many intense conversations. Well, as you will know, as we, as David, David has a habit of addressing to you a sudden, pressing, urgent question that I do find very hard to answer. But among David's qualities, which were a terrific sense of humor about which we've heard, there's also a great sense of the importance of correctness, um, certainly correctness of deportment and behavior. I was in uh, Turkey with David in 1980, when he received an invitation to the British Embassy, along which, uh, which I was included in. And David looked at me and he said, you've got to wear a suit. And I said, I haven't bought a suit, David. I've just got a jacket and tie and so on. I think I'd have bought one. He said, no, no, you've got to wear a suit. So after some discussion, David turned to his own wardrobe <laughs> <laughs> and produced a suit. And in order to appease him, as I hope to solve the matter, I did indeed put it on. But to those of you who remember David's uh, Construction. <laughs> uh, people perhaps not be surprised that when I put the suit on, I look like a figure out of a Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> as it turned out, when we went, and of course I did not wear the suit, uh, as it turned out, the embassy, when we went to the embassy, the ambassador was a man of such enormous height that when you met him, his eyes were fixed on the wall far above you. So I would have been wearing a grass skirt for the <laughs> Now, my subject really is to try, I suppose, and talk around uh, the book which Philip has mentioned, Hot in the Lives, in which David indeed picks up the story of a number of figures, uh, in both on the Ottoman and on the British, and indeed and including also on the American side of things, those people who had some connection with the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century. And I suppose the background to this, in a way, is that. Uh, the historiography of the Ottoman Empire has been revolutionized over the last 30 years. When I first encountered Ottoman history as a young graduate student, interested mainly in what happened 
at the end of the Ottoman Empire and why Britain became such an expansive power in the Middle East at the end of the First World War. There were very few books you could turn to about Ottoman history in the 19th century which were not simply, you might say, cliché written to the extreme. And of course, recently, I mean, uh, there's been an enormous industry and now a great many lively and fine whole rows of books on Ottoman history, including the 19th century. There's been a great revolution which has encouraged us to see the Ottoman Empire in some ways perhaps in a far more sympathetic light than is typical of the kind of literature of the 1960s and 70s which presented the 19th century as being an unending saga of disaster, and misgovernment, and decay. Now, I should, of course, declare or disclaim any uh, close specialist knowledge of Ottoman archives that don't have, or indeed of the literature in the Turkish language. Um, what I'm going to try and do is provide a sort of context around uh, the book which David has written, and I think we've already heard and there are some of those who disapprove me discusses in that book, Ali Pasha and Fuad Pasha and Midhat Pasha, the great performers of the mid and later 19th century in Turkey. Uh, Abdul Hamid, of course, the, the Sultan, the last Sultan, or the last of one Sultan, I should say. Um, but he also looks, of course, at uh, two of the ambassadors that were sent to the port, as well as the influential American journalist, Stillman, who was a port in Crete created a great impression around Europe, certainly in Britain and the United States. And that uh, uh, intriguing figure, Canon McCole, the great, you might say, sounder of the trumpet of Christian solidarity, the denouncer <laughs> of Ottoman barbarity. Now, in some ways you might say, and here one is perhaps drawing a little bit upon the notion of uh, Turkey or Ottoman Empire's comparative interest in the imperial system. Uh, one thing I can say about an empire like Turkey's, that is like the Ottoman Empire, is it was, as we can see in more recent times, an extraordinary achievement to maintain for so long uh, authority over such a huge expanse, not only in the Balkans, but also in the Middle East. <coughs> Other empires, I think, remind us that the key to maintaining your authority over uh, a great variety of subject populations is freedom from external interference as far as possible. The British Empire, you might say, is a very similar case from that point of view. Now, the Ottoman Empire uh, was able, in the period of its greatest success, to seal up the great entries into its Ottoman world. It guarded the access to the Black Sea, it guarded access through the Caucasus into, into Eastern Anatolia. It controlled the head of the Persian Gulf. And of course, its authority extended over um, the ramparts of it. It was defended behind the great ramparts of the Balkans. And its authority extended, of course, over Egypt and the Isthmus of Suez. Now, the background, really, to what David is writing about in this book is a series of almost simultaneous geopolitical disasters which destroyed the Ottoman Empire's ability to maintain these external defenses against interference or invasion or other forms of unwelcome, uh, unwelcome sort of, uh, influence <coughs> their populations. In the later 18th century, first of all, Russia at last achieved its objective of reaching the Black Sea uh, and in 1783 indeed conquered the Crimea. The back door into the Ottoman Empire is forced open. And that, of course, opened the way to further Russian incursions into the Balkans, leading to some of those famous encounters right down in Thrace and at the very doors of Constantinople in the 19th century. Secondly, of course, uh, you found at uh, the time of the Napoleonic Wars the invasion by Napoleon of Egypt. Now that had a consequence of opening the way to a new regime in Egypt in which the Albanian viceroy, Mehmet Ali, became a de facto an independent ruler. And it was indeed from Egypt that was launched a great assault on the Ottoman Empire in the 1830s, which really marks in some ways the opening of that era of Ottoman, shall we say, uh, difficulty 
times of disaster. The third great geopolitical change came about as a result of the expansion of British power in India. And India, as you all know, plays a large part in the way in which the British thought about the Ottoman Empire right through the 19th century. Because the expansion of British power in India brought the British into the Persian Gulf, and it gave them a direct interest in who controlled the Ottoman Empire's Arab provinces in what's now Iraq and Syria. And it gave them also leverage uh, along the areas which were formerly subject to Ottoman citizenship along the Gulf Coast. And of course, uh, all these concurrent geopolitical uh, disasters in the Ottoman front of view, uh, combined with the advance of the Russians into the Caucasus, so that by the early 19th century, the Russians in the are poised at the eastern door of Anatolia as well. So the Ottoman Empire had to respond to this set of geopolitical catastrophes, which really provide, as it were, of course, enormous encouragement, especially in the Balkans, to its Christian populations to seek some form of uh, independence, perhaps, or certainly relief from what is seen as being the oppressive power of Ottoman rule. Now, we know, of course, that the Ottomans did not respond uh, uh, entirely apathetically to this set of disasters. And as David recounts, of course, in his studies of Ali Pasha and Fred Pasha, there emerges a group of extremely influential Ottoman statesmen who set out to reform the Ottoman system, and especially through that great movement, which is going to the name, the Tanzimat, the reorganization. But that had come after what has seen almost an existential crisis for the Ottoman Empire in the course of the 1830s, when indeed Mehmed Ali and his son Ibrahim set out uh, from Egypt and made their way conquering army right up through the Arab provinces, and indeed at one point seemed poised to uh, eject the Sultan from Constantinople altogether, a move which was only checked by the desperate, in fact, appeal in some ways of the Ottoman Empire for Russian support to help them out of this extraordinary crisis. So the Tanzimat is a response in a way, a very obvious way perhaps, to the crisis of the empire in the 1830s, a crisis which lasts really right through the 1930s up until the early 1840s. But Tanzimat then is unrolled over the next 15, 20 years to reorganize the empire, make it a more effective defense, give it a more effective defense against uh, the variety of onslaughts, both external from Russia and France and Britain, and also from the internal revolt the Balkan people. Now, empires which seek to reform themselves often encounter a whole set of difficulties. The first is that if you seek to reform your empire by centralizing it or increasing the ability of the center to control what may seem to be rather recalcitrant provinces, you often run the risk of making your regime seem even more oppressive than it had been before, and therefore generating even greater revolt. And in some ways, despite the efforts which David chronicles of Ali Pasha and Fuad Pasha to bring about reforms in the Ottoman system, to raise uh, the status of Christian subjects, indeed by promoting what is sometimes called Ottomanism, to declare that all Ottoman subjects were of equal status, Christian and Muslim alike. Uh, this att attempt to reconcile Christians to Ottoman rule was a very, very limited success indeed, and arguably simply encouraged greater efforts by Christian movements, Christian uh, communities in the Balkans to seek some release from Ottoman rule in the nation state of their own. But the, the effect of uh, trying to reform the system had another unpleasant fortunate consequence for the Ottomans. And that is, in the course of trying to rally, or at least appease, uh, its Christian subjects to its rule, it ran the risk, of course, of alienating those who were its most reliable and loyal subjects, indeed, Muslims themselves. And this, again, is a great 
common imperial problem, that if you seek to appease those who oppose you, then you may indeed also alienate those who will be your smartest supporters and the strongest defenders of the imperial system. And to some extent, we can see precisely this happening through the course of the later 19th century, uh, something which Abdul Khalid, I'll turn to in a moment, tried to, a uh, movement which he tried to check in the reverse. Now, of course, the third great problem which arises for an empire engaged in a form of internal reconstruction is it needs a breathing space from external interference, uh, attack, or intervention. And this, the Ottoman Empire, was not granted. But as we know, in the 19th century, in the Crimean War, it became subject to a further onslaught, which had, of course, the consequence of imposing on it a huge burden of costs in terms of recolonizing its army, paying for the burden of its struggle against Russia on the side of Britain and France in the Crimean War. And that led famously, of course, to the bankruptcy of 1875, when suddenly uh, the Ottoman Empire found itself unable to borrow abroad except under uh, the supervision of European bankers in something called the Ottoman Public Debt Administration. And here again, the regime found itself seeming, uh, to, certainly to its most loyal supporters, to be bending the knee to all kinds of uh, unwelcome foreign interference. So a whole series of, I'd say, of concurrent uh, difficulties confront those who seek to reform the Ottoman Empire and make it into uh, an empire capable of reconciling its Christian subjects and its Muslim subjects and preserving its authority. Now, it's really in this setting that one of the other characters in David's story, Abdul Hamid, emerges. Abdul Hamid rejected, if you like, uh, the attempts of the reformers of the Tanzimat period. And he turned out to be, despite uh, his rather unprepossessing beginning, to be an extraordinarily astute uh, uh, manager of Ottoman interests, who learned very skillfully how to play off the great powers against each other. At the same time, of course, Abdul Hamid set out to rally uh, what you might call Islamic feeling within Turkey to make the Ottoman Empire a much more openly and obviously Islamic power than was happening. And of course, in doing that, of course, he alarms not least the British who are turning the minute, who are turning the minute, with the threat of a kind of pan Islamic movement across the Middle East, which might affect their uh, possession in India with its very large and often quite lively Muslim population. Now, what about the British side of things? Now, the headline story in terms of British attitudes towards the Ottoman Empire is usually seen to be uh, realpolitik. The anxiety of the British to maintain the Ottoman Empire as a barrier to Russian expansion into the uh, Middle East or into the, uh, any area which would allow particularly a threat to India. And in many ways, a whole British relationship with the Ottoman Empire is shot through with this vital connection to India, seen as being the essential second pillar of British imperial power in the world. And that connection with India had already brought the British into uh, the Eastern Mediterranean in the course of the uh, Napoleonic Wars and turned British interest in the East Mediterranean to something of far greater priority than it had been prior to uh, 1800 or 1780. Now, the British didn't have a particularly <coughs> coherent policy towards Turkey, despite the headline story that we've often accustomed to read about. There were many constraints upon British attitudes towards the Ottoman Empire, which made for far less coherent and decisive foreign policy than you might have expected given this great power of India. For a start, up until 1830, the British were very uncertain as to whether or not they wanted to promote Greece as being a separate state 
which would support British interests in the Mediterranean against an expansive Russia. And famous that the British fleet had helped the Battle of Navarino to prevent the Turks from the Turkish fleet from the fleet following <coughs> uh, the prospect of creating a new Greek state in the southern part of its now modern Greece. And in 1829, a British Foreign Secretary could remark that Turkey was a clumsy fabric of barbaric power which would soon sink under the weight of its own. <laughs> it's only really uh, in 1833 when the moment when the Ottoman Empire appeared to be on the brink of collapsing altogether in the face of this great Egyptian invasion that uh, Halverston, the British Foreign Secretary, uh, decides that defense of the Ottoman Empire <coughs> against <coughs> Russia had to be the main priority of British policy. And this he is able to sue through a variety of diplomatic um, uh, alliances and entente, first with France and then with Russia. Contrary to the usual opinion of Palestine as being a kind of uh, John Bull, he was actually a far more subtle diplomat uh, than is often credited. And that uh, commitment to maintaining the Ottoman Empire, uh, including its, much of its Balkan territories, as well as Turkey and Ottoman Empire in Asia, Turkey and Asia, remained true right through until the 1870s. And it's then that uh, a great policy revolution occurs in British attitudes towards the future of the Ottoman Empire. Now, the British were always constrained in their approach to the Ottoman Empire by the limitations, really, upon their uh, physical and military power. The British had a fleet in the Mediterranean, and of course they had a great naval base at Malta. But they lacked the military power on land to contemplate a landing an army uh, against the threat of a Russian attack. They did it, of course, in the Crimea, and you, argue, you might argue that after that they were unlikely to try and do it again. So their influence on matters Ottoman was, in some way, only, uh, could only be applied through the use of naval power. And perhaps the most important one is the prospect of a fleet being sent up the Dardanelles to anchor in the Straits to overall Constantinople. And that could be used, and was used, in 1878 to threaten uh, a Russian attack on Constantinople with a direct confrontation with British naval power. But the other constraint upon British thinking about the Ottoman Empire was, of course, the influence of a whole variety of other uh, opinion makers within Britain itself. Britain was a very plural <coughs> society in the last century in which foreign policy makers were not free to simply impose their own strategic priorities. There was, for example, a powerful movement of free traders. Richard Colton, a great free trader, once argued in a speech that Anatolia should be cleared of its Turkish inhabitants, and instead they should be brought in, he said, a large enterprising group of American settlers. <coughs> Not a project which got very far. <coughs> but a further, of course, a very powerful influence for the earlier part of the 19th century was the Phil Hellenism, which Byron, of course, had been the great example of. That Phil Hellenism has <coughs> Some of the audience here, as reminded us of his studies of Britain's relations with the Hellenes, did not really survive much beyond the mid 19th century, and was anyway a highly ambiguous sympathy towards the future of the Hellenic kingdom. But it's replaced, perhaps, by another very powerful emotion deriving from, in some ways, the intense religiosity not only of Victorian middle class population, but not least of its aristocratic establishment as well. And that is the belief that Britain had a duty, a responsibility towards the Christian inhabitants of the Balkans. And one of the most powerful and effective uh, champions of that view, as is really quite famous, was of course W. E. Gladstone, whose denunciation of the repression of Balkan Christians in the 1870s, which he termed the Bulgarian horrors, uh, was a very powerful influence 
British Anglo Jews had not, and effectively made it much more difficult by the late 19th century for any British government to openly support the surviving Ottoman Empire in Europe, in the Balkans. And that, in some ways, is the prelude to that great policy revolution which comes over British thinking about the Ottoman Empire in the late 1870s, when another master diplomat, Lord Salisbury, the most effective, you might say, of the later 19th century foreign policy makers, realized that no longer was it essential to British interests to maintain Constantinople and the Straits under Turkish rule and to the way and to to worry too much about the threat of a Russian presence uh, close to the Straits. Why? Because in the course of the 1870s and early 1880s, the British turned their priority, turned their attention much more to Egypt. Once in control of Egypt, after 1882, the British would regard Constantinople as being a far lesser priority <coughs> in their uh, system of imperial of geopolitics and field defense than it had been up until then. And that decline in the significance of the Ottoman Empire's particularly European possessions as a British priority continued right through into the uh, period up to 1914. And we know, of course, the British, as David documents in Ottoman Lives, played a part in the eviction of Ottoman power from Crete in 1897. British troops and ushered the Ottoman army's troops onto a war on ship uh, and effectively ended Ottoman control of Crete. Now, there is a last great episode in Britain's relationship with the Ottoman Empire, which I want to turn to. Famously, of course, the, in the run up to the First World War, the British had had entertained hopes that the replacement of Abdul Hamid by the young Turks would produce a regime far more sympathetic to liberalism and therefore far more open to British ideas about a constitutional government and a more open and liberal Ottoman system than it hitherto obtained, especially under Abdul Hamid. But of course, the outbreak of war in 1914 confronted the rulers of the Ottoman Empire with the prospect that the British and the French and the Russians, allied together against Germany and Austria Hungary, might give a green light to Russia to indeed take Constantinople, take this great uh, uh, target of Russian expansion, uh, as it seemed, several hundred years to place the recover the great center of Orthodox Christianity, bringing back under Christian rule, in this case under Russian rule. It seemed likely that that uh, objective of Russian power would be licensed by the British and the French as part of the terms on which Russia had joined them in the struggle against Germany and Austria Hungary. And indeed, that was true, because in 1915, under the Constantinople Agreement, British and the French accepted the idea of Russian control of the states and Constantinople. But as we know, Russia fell by the wayside in the course of 1918. It was not able to take up its uh, claim on Constantinople. But as a consequence, in part, of Russia's collapse in 1917-1918, the British themselves came to believe that the Ottoman Empire as an ally of Germany, which had already attempted to capture or recapture the Suez Canal and Egypt from British control, now constituted an ex ex existential threat to the British Empire because of its control over the Arab Middle East, the head of the Persian Gulf, and its alliance with Germany marching through the Ukraine into uh, the Caucasus, that it would actually be able to cut the British Empire effectively in half. Now the British were denied the alliance with Russia and were facing disaster indeed themselves on the Western Front. That is the context in which we see this last twist in the Anglo-Ottoman relationship, which is the decision at the highest levels of British government 
But Dominion must be Ottoman Empire be dissolved because it had turned into a great threat to Britain, far from being, as in the early 19th century, a war against Russian expansion to Mediterranean and towards Italy. It has now become a threat to the British Empire and must be dissolved at all costs. <coughs> and that particular event, in the view of Lord Curzon, who took his dominant influence on British policy in this region in 19, uh, 1918, 1919, that the Sultan must himself be evicted from Constantinople and allowed only to rule what remained of a rump of the Ottoman Empire from a city in uh, Anatolia, that's the best. That, as we know, did not happen. Uh, but the Ottoman relationship with Britain, like I say, ended in this very dramatic way because the British had turned their back on the Ottoman Empire had taken the Ottoman Empire's Arab provinces and indeed intended to keep the whole lot if they had their way and not to concede anything to France if they had to. Uh, the British had taken well not only the Ottoman provinces in, in the Arab uh, sector, but also intended to grab Constantinople as well and place it under an international regime. So here was a very tangled story in which the British had tried through the, through the period of the 19th century to reshape Ottoman governments by a mixture of threat and encouragement and support. But it, you might say, had only the most limited success in this, despite the proconsular behavior of British, embassy, uh, British ambassadors uh, in Constantinople. And then passed through a period of regarding the Ottoman Empire as being no longer so vital to British interest in the Middle East, and have finally turned to reject altogether any form of alliance and association with that empire, and sought indeed to consolidate it completely. Now what David has done in Ottoman lives, I think, is to give us a much closer and more direct insight into the lives of both the Ottoman reformers, which he depicts with great sympathy and in a very, very elegant writing. But also, I think, to bring out, as he does in his descriptions of the accounts of the two of the main British ambassadors in Constantinople, White and Mayor, all the complexities in their relationship with Ottoman politicians and, of course, above all, with the Ottoman Sultan and the Indian. So, what I've given is a very crude and simplistic account of that Anglo Ottoman relationship. <coughs> but those of you who are interested in taking this further uh, can do no better, I think, than to read David's portraits of these characters in his Ottoman lives. Thank you. Thank you. I may not have provoked too many questions that you've had, or you no doubt, in the, there are people here who are more expert than me on some of these things. Uh, I'll be very happy to try and answer any questions or see where this fashion takes it. Yes, thank you very much, John. That was wonderful, putting it all in the broader context. It was also the, the last flurry of Anglo Ottoman friendship when the Sultan left on a British battleship yes, as a British protege or student. So. Now, any questions? From the room. Yeah. Or indeed comments or criticisms or rebuttals mm -hmm. and <laughs> denunciation. Yes. <coughs> yes, David. Maybe that was terribly useful oversight because for me the outstanding problem of the late 19th century is why did we, the early 20th century, is why did we underestimate the Ottoman? the Ottoman tendency to hitch up with the Germans. So if we understood that better, mm. then the whole of the world, um, the whole of the world's history would have been changed. And that really was in our hands. We slightly got something wrong there. I don't know how that fits into your schema. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I think, I suppose it's because it's only quite late in the day <coughs> that uh, German interest in uh, the Near East becomes more obvious. I mean, famously, you know, Bismarck had regarded uh, the Balkans as being a very, <coughs> of very limited German interest. 
Um, and it really takes, I suppose, the Kaiser and his visit to Constantinople to suddenly signal the extent to which uh, German interests in that way might be used as a way, as a lever um, to, uh, against Britain's international position generally and as part of you know, the emerging Delta politik uh, that um, Berlin was beginning to pursue. So I think, I think there was, it was not necessarily very obvious. I mean, Salisbury had actually been quite successful in using uh, German diplomatic support um, in, uh, you know, in the 1880s, 1890s uh, as part of Britain's defense against you know, the threat of Russian expansion towards Britain. So, uh, and sort of made some big effort indeed to keep Berlin on side. It's really in the very late 1890s and run like 1900 that the Germans first really begin to see like uh, a, a major threat to Britain's global position. Until then, much less than that. And Lord Salisbury changes his mind. He makes a famous speech saying, we backed the wrong horse in the Crimean War. And it's, that's after the um, massacres in 1895 and 1896. And also, Germany did ask for British investment in the Berlin to Baghdad Railway, but the, but the city sort of sulked, I think. It, wouldn't, it didn't want to participate in a great German enterprise, as it had refused also to join in the Suez Canal. Mm. Um, and probably, as you said, the real reason is they didn't think they needed Turkey anymore, because they had Egypt. Yes, there was a question over there. Yes. I, I had a question. It's a bit tangential, yeah. or you can ignore it if you want. Um, in view of what's happening in Palestine today, um, I wondered if you had any thoughts on British Ottoman relations prior to World War One. There. Well, <clears throat> the, Brit I mean, the, the British take make a, a, a distinction, um, certainly by the late 19th century, between their willingness to see. Uh, Turkey in Europe, as they often called it, the Ottoman Empire in Europe, uh, become uh, a, a series of, of, of Christian states, um, national states, because they no longer regard uh, the Ottoman Empire in Europe as being a necessary part of the defense of the Ottoman Empire uh, as, a, as a bulwark of British influence in, in the Middle East and the defense of the route to India. But uh, they regard the preservation of Ottoman uh, power in Asia much more seriously. And in fact, even in their first attempt to think about how the Middle East should be reconstructed during the First World War, uh, their initial idea is very much to preserve an Ottoman presence in the Middle East, uh, but in some way to seek to uh, bring it under greater influence. So they're not, I think, at this stage, it's only quite late on in the war that they realize that um, the defense of the Suez Canal and of Egypt is going to require them to, you know, to, to, to invade the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and in a way, Palestine becomes, the real reason for British interest in Palestine is a very outward defense of the Suez Canal. Um, now, of course, as we know, that had another very important uh, consequence, which was the Balfour Declaration of 1917. But I think the British attitude towards Palestine was, again, I was so often the case, it was not a simple, uh, not a simple matter. It was a combination of a strategic interest in Palestine. And once you know, the need to defend the Suez Canal against the Ottomans becomes so apparent, uh, it's also, of course, the case and even um, after the end of the First World War, the resurgence of Turkey, especially under Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, brings that makes the British think that they're going to face, before very long, a resurgent Turkey, uh, which would seek to recover its Arab empires, Arab provinces in Iraq and in Syria. So you had to devise a system which would prevent that happening. So, uh, in some ways, I mean, there is a sort of notion in Britain, I think, um, that emerges that 
uh, the presence of Zionists in Palestine would be no bad thing as a kind of reinforcement of you know, their influence in this vital and strategic uh, sector with access to the canal and so on. So on. Any more questions? Yes, over there. Um, was a neutral Turkey in 1914 a remotest possibility had the confiscation of the two ships not taken place, the Winston Churchill confiscation. Is there any chance that it could have stayed neutral had it not been for that act? Well, I, I, answer, I, I don't know the answer to that. One, one suspects not because the fear of, uh, or the suspicion that the Entente would, uh, at the end of the war, uh, allow Russia um, to achieve this great, you know, um, objective of, of extending its power into the <coughs> Straits uh, was probably too strong. And that also, one has to remember that the time when the uh, Ottoman Empire joins the war against Britain, France, and Russia, um, it must have seemed likely that Germany would do rather well. After all, the opening phases of the First World War on the Western Front uh, didn't go well for the Western, for the Western powers of Britain and France at all. And the prospect, therefore, of Germany and Austria Hungary, I think, being able to uh, impose terms and to strengthen the power uh, in the way which the war from, must have seemed very attractive. So, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, there may be people in this room much more expert than me on this particular aspect of, of um, uh, the Young Turks diplomacy. But I suspect that the attraction of um, uh, joining Germany and Austria and Hungary was going to be too great. Was the German trained officer class quite widespread by then? Was the, was the German trained officer class quite widespread by then? Yes, I mean, after all, I mean, but already by then. Course, the Germans had effectively uh, transformed the Austrian mm. army, the Austrian officer class, into an army effective force. And I suppose, going back to what I was saying earlier about Abdul Hamid, I mean, after all, one of the things which was achieved under his regime uh, was, you know, the re reconstruction of the Ottoman army, and after all, his performance in the First World War was truly remarkable when you consider the extreme shortage of all sorts of supplies uh, in, in <coughs> available to it, and the almost desperate condition under which it had to fight uh, you know, so many of its campaigns. And the Ottoman army was only defeated at the end, very end of the war, effectively. And the personal influence of Enver, who knew Germany extremely well, yeah. and liked it, and admired it, and as you say, was convinced it was going to win. Yeah. Many people believe. More questions? More questions? No, well, thank you very much. Oh, yes. Uh, just during the First World War, there were several attempts to arrange an armistice or a peace agreement or a peace mm. or something between the British and the Turks. Mm. Um, Rahmi Ebranos was governor of Izmir, was actually involved in discussions with the British in a ship or chaos, I believe. Mm. Uh, after Jamal Pasha, who was the uh, commander in Syria, um, the third army, I think, was it? Uh, also, was in touch with the Armenian, actually, with the British, mm. over a range of some sort of sea power. And then the commander, uh, Chris Lamar, whose name is now escaped, who was Townsend. Townsend? Townsend. Townsend was also engaged in negotiations with the other boats. The army was taken prisoner. Why didn't the British agree to this? They could have, they could have, they could have finished off the Ottoman Empire, ended the war in the Near East, but, and saved thousands of lives if they'd taken those offers up. Why didn't they do it? Well, uh, yeah, it's hard to say, I think. I mean, whether or not, I mean, the, those negotiations would actually have worked. Yes. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, secondly, of course, there is the uh, question of the British relationship with Russia. Yeah. Russia Russian have agreed to such an office. The British are hardly likely to make a unilateral settlement yeah. with the Ottoman Empire. Because to have done so would have wrecked uh, the war effort in Europe. 
So I think it was also in French. Uh, well, I mean, who well, well, wanted to take over Syria and didn't want to Well, either way, you would have had to negotiate a deal yeah. with the Ottoman Empire in accord with Russia and France. And I think the chances, particularly of Russia, were very slim. So I think that, uh, you know, I've written been able to act unilaterally, but it might have been a possibility. But since it couldn't. And of course, the other question is I mean, what do they do? Here is that war in. Uh, Turks doing quite well. Um, so that the, you know, the prospect of a um, peace uh, with the Russians, well, would they have come through with it? Would got down to what would the, what would the price, what would the Ottoman price have been uh, for the uh, Russians? So I think, that, you know, no doubt there was some, as often the case of the war. Uh, there's often a prospect or something, but whether it's a hard prospect, it's more helpful. That's why I'm mm -hmm. Any more questions? No, well, thank you very much again.